In this video, we're going to cover everything you need to know to get 100% on experiments and samples questions on the SAT. Let's go ahead and start with the easiest concept, choosing a population. Whenever you have one of these questions where you have to choose a population, you really just want to focus on one thing. The type of people in the sample need to perfectly match up with the type of people in the population. For example, if I went to a gym and surveyed a bunch of redheaded gym rats with eye patches, I could only project those results onto other redheaded gym rats with eye patches from the same gym. So go ahead and pause the video and try this one on your own first. This is going to be an actual SAT style question that has this concept. And yeah, we're looking for this question stem where it talks about the largest population to which the results can be reasonably applied. So what kind of people do we have in our sample? We have seventh grade students from this science teacher's school. So we need seventh grade students from the school. A says in the state, that is too big of a population. Uh, a, B is exactly what I'm looking for. C says all the students in her classes, but it just says from the school, not from her classes. And then D, just the 50 students who participated in the survey. This is a weird one that shows up where it literally tells you you can only project it to the sample. We're not actually applying things to a sample. We know exactly what's going on with the sample. So we don't need to make any sort of an estimation. This is just a, a red herring. Uh, don't fall for that one either. Now, when we do get to making an estimation based on our sample, we need to focus on three things. Number one, we need to make sure that the sample is random. For example, if I wanted to figure out what people in my town felt about a new law that prohibits cats, I couldn't simply go and interview a bunch of people at the dog park. These are going to be very specific types of people who go to the dog park, usually dog owners and probably people who are less likely to be fond of cats. So that's an issue. That's not random. I would need to somehow pluck people randomly from the community, not from a single location within the community. And you see how this also lines up with making sure that the sample matches the population. Number two, we want to focus on trying to be like little Timmy here. Now, Timmy is very shy, very meek, and he's not very sure of himself. Whenever he says something, he uses what we call hedging language. Rather than say something like, hey, let's go get pizza, he would say, uh, would you maybe want to go and get a pizza? See the difference? You need to try and answer like little Timmy. You don't want to use any absolute language. You do want to use some sort of hedging language. So going back to the example of the redheads, if we found that 70% of our redheads liked cheese, we couldn't say that 70% of the population likes cheese. We would have to say something more like it is plausible or it is likely that 70% of the population likes cheese. Finally, the third thing you want to focus on when projecting results onto a population is the margin of error. Now, not all questions are going to have a margin of error, but a lot of them will. And basically a margin of error is a range that goes below the results of the sample and above the results of the sample. It's usually a percentage, but it's not always a percentage. Let me give you an example of this. Again, we'll go back to our redheads. So in our sample, we determined that 70% of the redheads like cheese. If we had a margin of error of 5%, that would mean our projection can dip 5% below that 70% and 5% above that 70%. So we could say something like, it is likely that between 65 and 75% of redheaded gym rats with eye patches from this gym like cheese. All right, let's take a look at some questions that test these three concepts. And for these questions, same thing, do pause the video and try them on your own first. So. This one is asking us which statement must be true based on our information. And both of the answers, before I even look at the question, we have an absolute statement, exactly 102. And then number two says, if another random sample, exactly 102 would be satisfied. So this is a big red flag that is absolute language. Neither of these are gonna work. I don't even need to look at the actual question stem. All right, what do we got going on here? 
Uh, which of the following is true about the survey? So, wanted to evaluate student opinions on extending lunch break times. Conducted a survey of 300 students who are members of the school's lunch committee. Okay, so without even reading the last sentence, we see an issue here. This is not a random sample. They are members of the lunch committee, but the principal wants to know student opinions. Not members of the lunch committee opinions, student. So that would mean like any student from the school. So A, it shows that majority, uh, no, it can't tell us anything because it is not a random sample. Uh, should have included more students from the lunch committee. <laughs> I think 300 was way too many. Uh, the survey sample should have consisted entirely of students who do not care about lunch schedules. That would also not be random. The survey is biased because it is not representative. Yep, that's the kind of language that you wanna look for when you do not have a random sample. So that's our answer. All right, let's take a look at this one, which does indeed mention a margin of error. So we've got uh, exercise habits, da, 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 and it's telling us, um, it's estimated that 40% of adults exercise at least three times a week. Margin of error is 2%. So first, let's get rid of any absolute language. Uh, B says it is not possible. That is way too absolute of a statement, so we're gonna get rid of it. Um, I see the word exactly in choice C. We're gonna get rid of that one. And now we've got some nice language, approximately, uh, and it is doubtful. So let's look at these answers. Approximately 2% of the adults who exercise at least three times per week actually do not. <laughs> okay, so that's a misunderstanding of what margin of error means, so that's not our answer. But then D says, it is doubtful that the percent of US adults who exercise at least three times per week is 36%. Now this would make sense because if we estimated 40%, our margin of error would be between 38 and 42%. 36 is below that, so it would be doubtful. And you know, doubtful is that nice, you know, little Timmy language that we're looking for. So that is our answer. All right, let's take a look at this one. We are gonna have some sort of a conclusion and let's see what's going on here. We got a sample of 200 high school students and 40% of them spent more than four hours per day on their phone. All right, um, does it say where they're from? No, just high school students. Uh, so A, the average screen time for all teenagers is about four hours per day. All teenagers is that is way too absolute that is not the timmy little timmy language we're looking for uh, b most high school students in the country uh, that's also too confident we don't have hedging language c and d give us approximately which we want right so approximately 40 percent of all teenagers was our sample teenagers no it was high school students so it's actually going to be choice d here making sure that again we want to match our population with our sample so you can see how these concepts are now starting to come together in these more challenging questions. Speaking of margin of error, every once in a while, you might run across one of these questions where you're asked to explain where it comes from. And this is what I'm talking about right here. It says, which of the following is the most appropriate reason that the margin of error for this sample is greater than the margin of error for this other sample? We don't really need to know what's going on here. The only thing that you need to know is that Margin of error is going to be based on how good uh, the quality, if you will, of our sample. And a good sample is random and it is big. Now, we know that if a sample is not random, that usually just results in a, a wrong answer on the SAT. So the one thing we do want to consider is how big is the sample? Because the bigger the sample, the lower the margin of error and the smaller the sample, the bigger the margin of error. So if the margin of error for sample X is greater, that means we had a smaller sample for uh, sample X. Finally, some questions will just have you do actual math and proportion and percentage techniques are gonna work for these types of questions. And this is what I'm talking about. Go ahead and pause the video and try this one on your own first. But basically we know that this is an actual math question because it's giving us actual values, right? Um, and it's saying that we have a sample of 1200 and that's a population of 80,000. The estimation was that 42% of alumni supported the increase, which means we could basically project that to our population. 
Now it does say there's a margin of error 4%, so we wanna include that as well. And because this is percentages, I'm just gonna use that percentage rather than do any sort of proportional thing. Uh, and we'll just use Desmos, because why not? So if we have a margin of error of 4% and our estimation was 42%, that means it's going to be between 38%. So 0.3, that would be of 80,000. And then 42 plus four would be 46. So 0.46 times 80,000. And basically what I've just done is I've created the range. It's gonna be between 30,400 and 36,800. The only thing that works is 33,600 because this one's too low, these ones are too high. And that's how you go about solving this question. Now, if you've stuck with me through redheaded gym rats, cheese surveys, and dog parks, you're probably the kind of person who actually enjoys learning, which brings me to the sponsor of this video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an interactive platform for learning math, science, and logic in a way that actually makes sense. Instead of watching someone else explain things, you're solving problems yourself, step by step. No grinding through hours of lectures or memorizing endless formulas. You just dive in, follow your curiosity, and let the lessons guide you. The more you mess with the ideas, the more they stick. I personally just started exploring their visual algebra course, and it completely reframes how you think about algebra. You know, the kind of math that just so happens to make up 70% of SAT math. You can start learning for free at brilliant.org slash penguin test prep or click the link in the description. And if you enjoy the platform, that link also gets you 20% off a premium annual subscription, which includes unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant.